Hey everybody, welcome back to Dimension Fold, the podcast and the YouTube channel. And uh, today we are very happy to welcome special guest author, uh, Dr. Joanna Kuyava, uh, the author of The Other Goddess, Mary Magdalene and the Goddesses of Eros and Secret Knowledge. Um, so yeah, Joanna, thanks for coming. Uh, it's great to have you on the show today. Thank you for inviting me, pleasure to be here. Awesome. So, um, so this book is is pretty interesting. I've I've um, actually read <laughs> probably about half of it already by now, and um, yeah, it's it's quite fascinating how you tie uh, Mary Magdalene and some of the ancient goddesses like Inanna and and that that whole tradition that flows through the Greek and Roman as well. Um, and then also uh, a bit of a tantric angle. So mm. I, there's a lot of interesting stuff. I haven't got to the end of the book yet, so I can't say what the book is really about. Why don't <laughs> you, uh, can you, can you, I know I hate to ask this question because uh, like when somebody asks me what my book is about, I'm like, well, it takes about <laughs> 300 pages to explain it. So go read that. But I'm going to ask it anyways. What what is the book about? Uh, what what are you what are you trying to say? Mm. That's actually a very broad question. And I, when I was uh, waiting here, you know, for you, I thought like I bet whether he ask can ask us these questions. I must yeah. have been like you know on the same thought wave yeah. because it is a difficult. Uh, as you said, you're an author yourself. It is a difficult. Uh, question to answer but basically it is a little bit um, uh, the book doesn't follow necessarily a logical thread it is about the spiritual journey and a research and what I was really looking at is at the uh, female sexuality and and the spirit and our sexuality human sexuality and how it is collect, uh, connected to our spirit because there is so much going on at the moment i think like the matrix is breaking breaking down at every level which yeah. i think is good you know it's scary but it's good it has to happen right and you know there's lots of also talking about you know using sexuality for some nefarious reasons right about different cults using it and so on and i'm not discussing it in my book so i don't want to mislead people but i was thinking based on my own experience i started to look about uh, traditions usually esoteric traditions that are on the margins of mainstream religions which in my opinion, all mainstream uh, mainstream religions kind of misinterpreted the messages of you know of great beings, mm -hmm. but uh, whether they use sexuality for the purpose of enlightenment, and of course they did, right? And when right. I was looking, then, and then I found so of course ta esoteric tantra, and I'm talking about classical tantra, not the Chinese or Taoist tantra or Western tantra, and I can explain this if you want later on. Sure. Uh, you know, talk about it. You know, they use sexuality for the purpose of enlightenment, for the expansion of consciousness, and for experiencing the divinity within us. And I think, and that's why I also the book takes such a broad, you know, you're right, broad view. You're very right about it. Because also the Gnostic Gospels, the ones discovered in Nain Hamad in 1945 and earlier, like the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, they also talk about, you know, the div divinity, God, goddess, you know, what had, you know, the sacred is within you. It's everywhere, right. but it's also within you. So find this divine spark within you. And very often when people are trying to look for this divine spark within themselves, they basically try to go in a traditional way by suppressing certain parts of themselves, right? They think that spirit has to be somehow different from sexuality, for example. So I, I know it is controversial, but I started to look at sexuality as a means of enlightenment, not as an obstacle, but as a means of enlightenment. And right. perhaps a I lot can of times we have like a kind of a, a dichotomy where it's like either, um, you know, it, it's almost like spirit and versus flesh and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, good versus evil. And so the spirit is assumed to be uh, a good thing. And then you're a lot of times the flesh is seen in a very negative light um, mm -hmm. and then the whole material world, in fact. And so we, we get, I mean, I think that's, that concept is really steeped in 
um, in Christianity for uh, like very um, many traditions that, that are very ascetic and very um, self deprecating in a way, or like, um, yeah. you know, they don't, they, they flee pleasure really. And um, it's a strange thing. I think, I mean, a lot of that comes from the apostle Paul uh, probably, but there's, there's a lot of weird stuff. And to me, that seems, it seems like it's kind of unhealthy, right? Like, do you, do you yeah. talk about that? Yeah, I talk about it. it is unhealthy. So, but instead of focusing, you know, that, uh, on the fact that it is unhealthy, I'm focusing, you know, how it can be used for, you know, enlightenment and my own experience, which I described in the book, you know, from as in esoteric tantra, would gave me, you know, experience right. of cosmic consciousness, but also, you know, traditions that may, people say, okay, anybody can say that they have an experience, right? And I also spoke to other people who had experiences, but also I looked at legitimate traditions, which are usually in, you know, in the esoterica, that that actually have methods for this, right? That invite, although you, you cannot provoke it, you cannot provoke enlightenment, you know, you, you just can open up to this, right? And you work towards this. So you're right. And, and, and traditionally, Christianity, especially, but also other religions, to be fair, you know, in, including yeah. Hinduism, including all religions, they try to dispel... Um, sexuality and when i was studying at my master's degree at university of toronto at the pontifical institute you know i was studying early saints you know uh, church fathers you know in egypt and also saint augustine but you know great uh, uh, saint from the from the fourth century that really shaped what you know catholicism is and christianity but actually whether you're protestant or catholic you know he shaped your thinking in many ways yeah, and sure. they all tried to deny their sexuality and it was actually for me as a woman you know it was kind of a hilarious experience because you know at the, at the time i truly believed in all of this i'm not a catholic anymore but i truly you know believed in this and i was a not only devout catholic but also you know very serious student and 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 you you so, for example, they would ask themselves questions, how many erections a, a man can have and still call himself, himself a saint? You know, <laughs> is it like free? I, and I don't remember, I'm not going to lie, but it was free, but I'm not sure if it was free per month or pre, free per year. Right. Or say, Saint Jerome <laughs> would say, Saint Jerome, which is a little bit older than, than Saint Augustine, but contemporary, he would say, okay, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm on the desert, you know, trying to repress my sexuality. He uses different vocabulary by basically this, you know, praying to God all the time on my knees. And I still see bare-breasted dancers from Rome, in, you know, so they tried this, you know, we right. can laugh, but they tried this and it didn't work for them. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, and yeah. I, honestly, it's not very difficult, not very different from the way I was raised in a in a pretty conservative church. They're still teaching that same stuff. Um, I mean, it's it's framed a little bit differently, but it's very much, mm -hmm. um, you know, oh, sex is good, but you can't do it, and nobody can unless they're married. And mm -hmm. maybe you know, if all these certain conditions are right, maybe you'll have fun. But at mm -hmm. least you can make children. And it's like this very fucked up view of sex and of uh, relationships, really. Um, I was, and only uh, for the purpose of procreation, only. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah, mostly, right? Um, yeah, it's it's really strange. And um, like, to me, that's, uh, it's, when you see these guys, like, and it's mostly male um uh, men who are writing like you know all these all these saints uh who have uh, been influencing religion for thousands of years are primarily men um who are yeah they're they're trying to repress their their desires and so by doing that um it kind of paints womanhood and the feminine in general in a very negative light as the evil temptress and um like that's really, really messed up. And like, I th w just think of how that has played into all of these other, uh, you know, the patriarchal systems and um, these just other ways uh, that, that males have to hang on to power structures and all of this stuff. So like, I guess, do you have any thoughts on that specific side of things? 
No, but, but the evil temperance, it's very interesting because it's this famous, you know, thing about St. Anthony on the desert, you know, and he's being tempted, you know, it's always the, the female figure that is tempting. But actually, I think it is their own suppression that caused it, because I will go back to St. Jerome, who basically said if a woman covers her up so she doesn't show anything uh, of her body to a man, then she forces his imagination to imagine what's behind the clothing. And if right. she shows part of her body, then she's obviously evil, right? Because she wants him to want her. So I actually, I felt sorry for him because I felt obviously he was a very, he was a brilliant man and you know very sensual man, and he didn't accept a part of himself, and none of them did. For some of them, it was a pure misogyny. I'm so, because you know they said, "What is a woman but just pile of blood and flesh?" You know, like it was really they, they say horrible thing. But also, I think that they didn't realize what later, much later, Carl Jung, the Swiss psycho psychoanalyst, you know, said. You know about the shadow. That shadow is not bad. It is something that we suppressed. And what I really love, you know, in this definition, he says. You cannot argue it out of its existence. Right. It is there. So you right. can try to suppress it. You can, you can suppress it. You can vilify it. You can try to ignore it. But it is there. So right. since but we have to sexual... embrace it. Yeah. yeah. That's right. You have to yeah, embrace it. There's, there's so much power in that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot and of I this really that... is about power, though, isn't it? It is. So I think mm -hmm. that if you, uh, if you let me... Uh, just add one more thing. Sorry if I interrupted mm. you. It is yeah. that it also, I think, a relationship with sexuality in general, but also female sexuality, which is, was always considered, and it's probably true, quite unpredictable. Our sexuality, Eros, is unpredictable. It is a very powerful thing. It's like a nuclear power. It can be good, it can be bad, right? But it is is there it is powerful so some esoteric traditions instead of repressing it because it may be dangerous you know what i mean because it can be mm -hmm. dangerous it's often misused right sure, this yeah. what if we use it for the good what if we use for enlightenment what if we use it for spiritual evolution rather than pretending it's not there or try to get rid of us because people try to get rid of us and you know it is still there right 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 mm. yeah that's uh, that's really really good i mean i think I, I think that maybe is one of the main points that that i get out of your book is that um mary magdalene and jesus as well uh, kind of their their point that they were trying to get at was that hey there is this enlightenment uh, and like here's some idea of what that might look like um maybe they don't like explain it in, mm. in great detail how can you explain in enlightenment mm. in great detail um mm. but it's it's kind of like um the the concepts are similar to some of the streams that that you might see in taoism or buddhism or or hinduism um i don't think that they're not necessarily exactly the same and probably all of those different um systems are also messed up in in various yeah. ways um but it's interesting like what what is i guess in your experience or in your in your theor theories and and studying around it um what is this enlightenment that uh, that they're talking about mm -hmm. so that's interesting so i think that so first of all that's why i'm also because the, your question is very broad again. So first of all, with Mary Magdalene and Jesus, you know, I, I would refer people again to Gnosticism, you know, so the knowledge is within, really the knowledge is within. And that's why it was dangerous and lots of Gnostic Gospels, I mean, none of them were actually accepted, you know, to the canonical Bible, right, in the right, fourth right. century during the Council of Nicaea, I'm sure your listeners know this. Because they were basically saying, you don't need all of the structures, you know, and in the meantime, Roman Empire is trying to accommodate uh, Christianity, right, integrate Christianity, and they want the structures because well, this is where the power is, right? Yeah. Where Gnosticism, although there's not such thing as Gnosticism, Gnostics, are, I call them like modern, uh, ancient conspiracy theorists who just say, you know, I don't believe mainstream narratives. Right. 
right? Like, and especially right. about spirituality, especially about divinity. So, you know, in, in ancient Alexandria, I imagine them like drinking, you know, some fragrant teas and arguing about, you know, what, what is div divinity, you know, and how we can go there and that the truth is really lying within us. So I, I think that, that this is really important. So this is what the Gnostics said. And I think that uh, the representation of Mary Magdalene in Gnostic writings uh, as the favorite disciple of Jesus and also as his partner, his intimate partner, because he, it is called, she's called koinoinos, which means intimate partner, not necessarily a wife. And I would like to focus on them because I think that their relationship was primarily spiritual and sexual at the same time. But what I'm arguing sometimes in my book, and perhaps I'm a little bit radical and different from other writers who write about it, that I do not necessarily believe that they, it, she has to be framed again into the format of a wife and a mother. And this is what people try to do. Because, for example, in Catholicism, when I was Catholic, there was already the Divine Mother, which is Virgin Mary, right? And right. I think that some people are trying to make her into this mother archetype again. I'm talking about Mary Magdalene here, except that, you know, she had sex with Jesus and she was married to Jesus. And I think she represents a completely different archetype. And that's why I'm bringing these archetypes of these other goddesses, like Sumerian goddess Nimna, Inanna, Ishtar, Hathor, Isis, because they are represented in our imagination and our mythology with the same symbols. They're always associated with giving some kind of secret knowledge to human beings. They are always represented, often represented with a serpent. They're represented with a, an egg or a fruit, you know, of knowledge, with a tree of knowledge. And they're always present and they're present or actually agents of the resurrection of us partner male partner right right, right. so, uh, so I, I wanted to think... ask you before i forget mm -hmm. so you're you're mentioning the fruit and the egg uh the egg-shaped object do you think that the uh, sumerian and akkadian and babylonian traditions of the uh, well typically we call we call them anunnaki nowadays but mm -hmm. there's a lot of these um you know in, engravings where there are these various figures um, sometimes sort of half bird looking men, but basically these these humanoid figures, and they're always holding this kind of pine cone thing. Do you mm. think that that is the same um, object uh, as that that you talk about here? I love this question because I do believe it is true. So, yeah. for example, when I in my book, I say that in, in at the beginning of part two of the other goddess, I say, you know, I went to Jerusalem and I'm in this church of Mary Magdalene on the Mount of Olives. And I see this painting of her with this egg, you know, and there's a medieval explanation of it, which I think is very naive because but but carries some truth in it. And with other goddesses and gods, you know, have the same kind of similar objects. So whether it is a pine cone or whether it is a fruit or whether it is an egg, it actually looks the same, right? It's this kind of right. similar, yeah. similar object. And I think that this symbolizes exactly some kind of gift to humanity that, you know, it is a symbol, but it's a gift of humanity that these female goddesses were presenting to humanity, right? So mm -hmm. I do believe it's the same project. Uh, object and when you speak about anunnaki often a question pops up you know do you think they're good or bad because you know some anunnaki you know there's lots of about the bad anunnaki and i would say they're probably good like in the stories about the anunnaki they're good and very bad mm -hmm. yeah, right? for sure. and yeah. i'm quite convinced that you know they did play with our dna that's why the representation of goddess nimna which is the most ancient western goddess you know of any significance apart from the maternal goddesses you know fertility and so on She's mm -hmm. represented not only with this object in her hand extended towards a male figure who represents humanity, not only with a tree of life and knowledge next to her, but also with a upright serpent behind her. The upright serpent represents, you know, wisdom in mm -hmm. all Gnostic traditions and, you know, esoteric traditions. In esoteric Tantra, it represents awakened uh, Kundalini energy, which is basically awakened uh, in enlightened energy within a body and I come up with an idea that you know lots of people came up actually as well that it can represent a, a, the helix of our DNA which is basically mm -hmm. the supposed the supposed junk DNA right so they, they just are there to awaken it so I think right. they, they played with our DNA you know so 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 there is a so there is a connection there and right. then mm -hmm. 
Um, well, yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean that ties back with the some of the stories that that pop up in in all the ancient literature um, from the Sumerian um, mythology, if you want to call it that, or you know, history, um, mm -hmm. and then even to the Bible with the story of the Nephilim and mm -hmm. um, the along with how you know how Adam and Eve uh, were supposedly created and and then again with Noah there's all these things where there's there's um, there's phrases like you know purity but it's like not a purity of action it's a purity of uh, it sounds seems to be talking about uh, genetic purity in some mm -hmm. of some mm -hmm. type which of course we have to be careful because we can start mm -hmm. to uh, get into you know some really dangerous uh, i don't know dangerous eugenics yeah eugenics. yeah exactly yeah. right like yeah. you know no, that's I, what the nazis yeah. were into that's um right. so but like when it comes to who are the anunnaki and who are the nephilim and all that stuff it's we, we everybody assumes that those guys are a different group and then they were messing with our dna which i think is true except mm -hmm. that they okay somebody was messing with somebody's dna and and this story is about us in some way but how do we know that they are not us like maybe mm -hmm. we are the nephilim maybe we are the anunnaki and the people who write wrote the story were either maybe were were us or were some somebody on the other side of the story like Absolutely. we don't know Right. Absolutely. And, you know, mm -hmm. it could be asked from the future, you know, these are the theories too, because recently I had a very interesting conversation with Professor Jeff Kripal, you know, uh, from Rice University in Texas, who looks oh, into yeah. spiritual, he's, he's very bright, you know, he's very brave, you know, not, not only he spoke about spirituality and sexuality, but now he's into like alien abductions and spirituality, very much like Diana Pasuka, which I'm very happy to say she wrote endorsement for the other goddess, you know, I was so yeah. happy. You know, spiritual experience and, for example, abduction or, you, you know, UFO experiences, you know, how close they can come and that it could be even, you know, future us, right? Yeah. So, uh, so there is something going on. And that's why I like these two, two particular scholars, Diana Pasuka and Jeff Kripal, because they are the only two open-minded scholars that I know that, you know, Jacques Vallée, of course, before them, right? Yeah. Who, but I'm talking about now, uh, who are actually brave enough to talk about it, you know, that spiritual experience is not just some angelic figures with wings, you know, and it's all good. It's actually, it can be very weird. It can be uh, and anyone who had spiritual awakening. It, it was probably terrifying and probably turn your life upside down. You know, it's not just uh, yeah, walking yeah. on rose petals, you know, seeing unicorns. It's not like right. that. It completely rewires you. So it opens up the doors of perceptions, gospel of uh, Thomas says, right, or yeah. uh, or even Blake. So 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 um, absolutely, you know. So all of these things are possible, you know. All of this possible, and I think that uh, there is always uh, somebody continuously uh, is in contact with us. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. I just look into the goddesses, you know, into the female perspective. But uh, I, you are absolutely right. I think to assume that uh, we, we are not doing it by ourselves. Let's put it this way. Right? Yeah. And, and even the most conservative uh, guy, the Apostle Paul, even he talks about his uh, alien abduction where he mm. was caught up into the seventh heaven and mm. he doesn't know if he was in the body or in the spirit. What mm. the hell is he talking about? He mm -hmm. was probably in a UFO. Um, mm. Something strange happened to him. Or, um, or interdimensional, some kind of, I, I like, because when I ask who are these goddesses, so I basically give free explanation. So mm -hmm. I said, one, it could be it's, they're just something is resurfacing in a, a collective unconscious, you know, in Jungian terms, you know, because mm -hmm. we all, you know, it's resurfacing now in a very powerful way, especially the feminine side of this, you know. Yeah. And so we remember this with the same symbolism, which is a language of, uh, of uh, uh, imagination of unconscious right then the other one is that it is actually some entity that for example like Nimna, Inanna, Ishtar, Isis, Mary Magdalene that continuously uh, reincarnates herself right and and the, the same would go for male deities you know Jesus and, and others so and and 
or perhaps they are actually interdimensional or even biological identities. And I actually had this conversation with Jeff Kripal and, uh, and, and he said, you know, that so, so, so many people had so many experiences like that, that he believes it is quite possible to, as well. So mm -hmm. even the most radical, that there are some kind of entities, you know, and not necessarily yeah. even the reincarnation of the same entity is, yeah, is, for is sure. very likely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've, I've spoken to uh, um, several uh, alien abductees and in, in their mind, there's no question whatsoever that there was a physical being um, yeah. that was interacting with them. And in some cases um, performing what appear to be some kind of medical experimentation on them or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, and there's so many people that, that are saying the same thing that uh, like how this really to me is a fundamental question because you have um, scientists who are like, oh, that's crazy. And therefore all those people are crazy. But what does what does crazy mean? Is there even such thing as crazy? Like, I think we really need to um, kind of reevaluate this whole concept of of insanity and and like people having hallucinations and all this stuff where that kind of stuff just doesn't happen. Uh, I mean, without some kind of, you know, uh, outside intervention, you like I know. I know, and you know, I just think that what, uh, what else you have to redefine it is, for example, uh, academia or academy, as they call it in North America. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's academy is good in a sense that, you know, it gives you certain um, discernment because, you know, then uh, this, so it's discernment meaning like not everything you hear is true and not everybody, you know, is truthful. And, you know, it's good to check your sources and give credit to other people. At the same time, it puts such limits on our investigation. Mm -hmm. You know, that basically yeah. nothing meaningful can be explored in any meaningful way because there are so right. many barriers, you know, so like right. the same way we talk about Egyptian pyramids, no, they are only that old, you know, like you right. cannot go, there are no pyramids in Bosnia. Well, BS, there are pyramids in Bosnia, you know, yeah. like yeah. there are pyramids around the world. So, so the same with this, you know, so they just will not accept it because they are looking from a point of view of materialistic determinism, which basically means, you know, it starts all with matter, it's all only about the matter, right? When, right. uh, when, uh, uh, when this is, uh, when spiritual experience is not just about the matter, and, you know, it's, it, and there's so much evidence that other people, other beings are being involved. And it, what is interesting, for example, and this is how, you know, when I talk about it in The Other Goddess, but also Jeff Krapal, he says that lots of uh, abductees do not mention the fact in only private, you know, when you do research with them, that actual uh, sexual arousal is part of the abduction, you know, so there is some, they want the sexual energy as well. Uh, okay. So it's not only about medical procedures, right. you know what I mean? And then yeah. just people said don't mention it because they, they are already being ridiculed. What about... You know, now yeah. this, you got right? turned on by your aliens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Like imagine that. Like they need this ridicule <laughs> on top of this. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, okay, so I'm I'm gonna edit this part out, but I just want to let you know my Zoom is acting stupid. I yeah. even though I have the pro plan, it's yes. it's telling me that it's gonna end my meeting soon. So uh, looks like it's going to cut us off in 10 minutes, but um, I think we can probably uh, get one more question in and then I can restart it if we need to. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so I did want to mention, ask, um, so we're talking about, you know, Ishtar and, and Inanna and, and these, these um, sort of these, it's an archetypal kind of a thing. Um, you mentioned young and, um, like, so there's, I guess that brings up two questions for me is that like, when we, when we begin to look at uh, Mary Magdalene through this archetypal lens, um, I'm, I'm, I'm always very aware of the fact that, you know, we have to, um, it's, it's good to think about archetypes, but also we're applying these archetypes back onto what something that was, that literally happened. Um, so, I mean, I think in this case, uh, it's probably fairly safe to assume that Mary Magdalene was a real person in a real place in a real time. Um, I don't know that anyone's really, uh, you know, debating that. 
Um, but how, so I guess like when we're now, when we kind of apply these archetypal images onto this person who was maybe just a normal person, uh, unless of course, like you say, maybe there's some kind of reincarnation of some kind of goddess, like it's weird because we can't, they're kind of two things that, that are hard to reconcile. Mm-hmm. So, so, so your question is like, was she just a normal person and I'm, uh, and I am uh, imposing the archetype on her, right? Well, this is maybe, I, I guess, sure, mm -hmm. that's a good question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, because I just want to get to the bottom of your question. And yeah. look, of course it is possible, but I think that we all, because, you know, we all have these archetypes within us. And some of us may be training from you know, from the beginning of our lives, like, for example, there is some evidence that Mary Magdalene was trained for this, even that Mary was, you know, the mother was trained for this as well, you know, to fulfill certain archetypes. So oh, if yeah. not a goddess, there may be a priestess, you know, so the archetype is really an imprint, you know, so you want to follow the spiritual slash sexual path, you know, towards the enlightenment. So it's, you are in training. So you fulfill a particular archetype and archetype for me is a possibility. Right. That's you a know? really, really cool way to look at it because um, Jesus was trained in archetypal uh, mm -hmm. ways, as was Moses, mm -hmm. um, for sure. I mean, like Moses was grew up in the house of Pharaoh. Like mm -hmm. you can't get any better training in the entire world. That's um, right. Yeah. That's and some people believe that Moses was also Akhenaten, right? So there is more and more yeah. scholars, like serious biblical scholars talking about it. So it's not yeah, only Yeah, for sure. I think yeah. that's a very, very strong case. Mm. Um, okay. Uh, so my next question. So, you know, it reminds me also of the um, a, a theme that is very consistent throughout uh, large portions of the Old Testament is mm -hmm. that... Um, you know, the, the Israelites are always uh, sort of fighting what they refer to as, um, uh, well, usually like idolatry. Um, and a lot of times it's, it has something to do with something called an Asherah pole. And mm -hmm. I'm, I think that, the, that this Asherah is none other than Ishtar. Mm -hmm. And so like, there's some kind of um cult or you know maybe these guys are essentially the gnostics um so this whole idea of you know the catholic church quelling out gnosticism in the fourth century might have been going on for uh, two thousand years before that and the same type of thing happening um because you have a lot of the same types of thematic elements you've got these the asherah poles which is again like a tree. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like the the standing serpent. It's like this the the whole all of these motifs, like even the DNA and and all this stuff that you were were mentioning. Like, um, any idea on that? Have, is have you seen any evidence about that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, first of all, Asherah, you know, was present at the beginning in you know in Israelites beings you know so now they're even finding the you know engravings of asherah you know yahweh with his wife you know so it's freaking oh, okay. out people you know in israel and in fact although i do not like uh, do not do not write about asherah in the other goddess she has exactly the same symbolism that you know inanna for example has the nimna and you know all of them so because the pole is actually they call it the axis mundi which means which is also represented by serpent which means a portal between death and life or portal between different dimensions which will get you know again so right. and so that somehow and this is what i repeat in the other goddess over and over again the goddess and and the axis mundi or the portal or the serpent she is somehow necessary for this transition between dimensions or what some people right. would call between death and life you know or you right. know or ascension you know she's essential for it so there, that's why this archetype of a priestess that i was talking about before goddess priestess you know whatever it is about that they are trained to allow for this uh, process of moving between dimensions or what in christianity is called you know uh, resurrection basically right like right, right. 
So, so it means yeah. moving, moving yeah. to somewhere else, you know, into more subtle body, so to speak. So very necessary. And Asherah is represented with Asherah's pole as well. But even now, there is archaeological evidence that, you know, the early Israelites worshipped her as well, together with Yahweh. And somewhere, and, you know, because I, I, I'm not an expert on Old Testament, but somewhere, and but there are people who, who write about it, eloquently and it's a great research you know that that at certain stage she was just removed you know like the, right. at certain stage the goddesses were removed so i don't make it into anti-man you know argument at all i'm just saying that for us as humanity someone didn't want us to know about this power of moving between dimensions or having some power over death and life or you know spiritual evolution through sexuality which basically is more holistic rather than you know repressed you know what sexuality mm -hmm. And, and, and they removed a, a, a person, it just happened to be a woman, goddess, priestess, that was facilitating it. And right. instead, we're just forced into this kind of strange uh, mainstream religions that basically say, obey sinner, right? right. Be right. Because you're a sinner, you have to obey. So this yeah. is what I'm saying, yeah? That, uh, so th that's basically the argument, pretty much, that I'm giving. Yeah. And they represented some other way of ascending, some other way of reaching the spiritual evolution, you know. Right, right. So, okay, so you mentioned sin, and this is going to get us into a bit of a gnarly topic. But you, you say in your book that um, you, I think you quote the, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. And where there's a dialogue between Jesus and Mary and a few of the other disciples. And um, I believe it's Peter who asks Jesus um, something about um, what so, something about sin. What what is the tell us sin about or... the sin, right? Tell yeah, us yeah. Sin. yeah, yeah. And Jesus says, What there, there is, is no, no such sin. thing as sin. Yeah, there is and no sin. So <laughs> it's great, right? But like that and, and to me that is. Um, that seems accurate when you compare it to the other things that Jesus said and did through the through the Gospels. Um, but we we then are we're so used to reading about Christianity through the Pauline lens, and who Paul is very big into sin, um, and so to me we can't we can't um, make that make sense because we think that Jesus came to save us from our sin. So if mm -hmm. Jesus is saying there is no sin, um, it makes me wonder, okay, let me think about the other times that Jesus talks about sin in the, in the other, in the, in the canonical gospels. I can only really think of one instance where he specifically um, addresses somebody's sin. And that is, um, remarkably, because this is now very similar with the, these whole uh, themes of the, the feminine and and these other powerful imagery, is when he's talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And he talks about, you know, they discuss her, basically her sexual relationships and how mm -hmm. she's had several husbands and, and now she's with a man who's not her husband. And, and so we typically read that with a very um like jesus says to her go and sin no more and mm -hmm. we we generally tend to read that as okay you've been sinning so you have to stop um mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily the only way to read what that his comment there because what if he's really saying um okay like maybe he's we don't know what tone of voice he was using maybe he was sounding very sarcastic Maybe it was very obvious to her that uh, that that he did not believe that she was sinning. Um, mm -hmm. We just don't know that, and that's kind of the only time that I can really think of Jesus. If you if you can use even these language this language that kind of an acute ac accusatorial um, tone, mm -hmm. but we don't know if that tone was there or not. Um, it's. Go ahead. 
Yeah, so uh, I understand. So it's not only the tone of voice, but also in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, when he says there is no sin, then he proceeds to explain what he means. So he doesn't mean that you cannot do anything wrong. He just mm -hmm. says that there is no like inherent sin, so to speak, you know, like you're born sinner, you know, like right. it is more like, so he basically explains because then we can also ask a question about, okay, so what about evil and suffering? But he basically says that sin is when you act not seen in the way we see it, but you cause harm to yourself and other people if you act from on your lower instincts. This is in brief, he says. Right. So yes, you can have relationships, but you know on, on what level of consciousness you enter these relationships. Right. So he's he's basically saying, don't be an asshole. That's uh, like, right. <laughs> you know, if you if you're gonna um, have sex with somebody, make sure you're nice to them also, and That's that right. you have a nice relationship. And then it's good. Uh, but and if what is the intention behind this relationship? Don't be an yeah. asshole, because if you are, there are consequences to you and this person. Right, right. So we've completely um, misread, like misunderstood, uh, I think, Jesus's whole point um, mm -hmm. in, in so many ways. I mean, he was very much, he was a healer. He was a, he, he was a teacher, but he didn't go around telling people stuff, really. There's only two recorded um, instances where he did anything that we would uh, that we would even remotely resemble preaching uh, or, or even teaching for that matter. Um, the Sermon on the Mount and the feeding of the 5000. And those are very few inc instances where he's he's kind of talking to people, giving a speech. Um, but even then, we can't understand what he's talking about. Like he's saying a lot of weird stuff. Um, really he's not into teaching people and and showing people the way he's he's into healing people and he's into love um mm. and so we've totally misrepresented that and uh that the i mean sure there there is there are ways that that christianity and the church are loving and that christians are loving um but there are also a lot of ways where they're really the opposite of that and um and I think that uh, part of that is is because of the um, this loss of focus on what Jesus was saying, and and then further what Mary and and Peter and James and his other disciples, and especially the Gnostic uh, part of it, were saying. Um, and instead, we've shifted the entire focus onto this idea of hell and sin and salvation which um, frankly does not really exist in, in the Bible until Paul comes along. Je Jesus doesn't talk about hell. Uh, the Old Testament has no concept of hell. In fact, uh, the Old Testament talks more about um, reincarnation than it does about hell. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, the, the Old mm -hmm. Jewish Old Testament um, is more, has more similarities to Hinduism than it does to uh, modern Christianity in many ways. Um, yes. So yeah, it's it's odd because like this whole idea then of like we we you know we can say that we're Christian and we can say that we follow Jesus, but do we follow Jesus because we're not doing the things he said, uh, we're not doing the things he did, and instead we're we're really focused on a whole bunch of stuff that was didn't he didn't seem to care about um i think we follow a wrong story of jesus i would say because mm -hmm. instead of especially in catholicism but i think in the rest of christianity too we focus on the cross crucifixion and resurrection which i think was completely misunderstood and mm -hmm. you know and with, i can discuss Mary's magdalene role in this as well but also instead of focusing on the teachings and, you yeah. know, Gnostics believes that Jesus gave three levels of teachings, one to the people of around the Lake of Galilee, you know, very simple parables that may be even difficult to understand for a modern person because they're related to, you know, to fishermen and, you know, farmers and so on. Second, to, her, to his disciples and the third level to Mary Magdalene, whom he considered, you know, most dis advanced disciple, according to some Gnostic teachings. Right. And, you know, when you are with a spiritual teacher of this caliber, you know, when your most greatest teaching comes from being in presence, in his presence. Mm -hmm. 
and you know energetically and also by observing his actions you know how he treats others and so on that cannot be included in the scriptures so i think the scriptures the canonical bible only refers to the teach the first level of teachings you know the, the, the simple parables right. and the ones that were used not dangerous you know for the state which uh, which frankly you know i believe that most interesting teachings were left out so th that's right. my interpretation of this right right and, so and were, so would you say would you say then that okay so mary magdalene and maybe a handful of others uh were aware of and were had been um in well not indoctrinated is the wrong word entirely what am i trying to say um basically had been almost baptized into this other um the second level i guess second and third level because second yeah. level according to the gnostics was for you know other disciples because they have a benefit of his presence you know and i'm sure like around the fire when they were sitting or walking you know he would not only be teaching them but also you know being around him was the greatest teaching right mm -hmm. but for example some gnostic uh, documents such as the gospel of mary magdalene or even pistis sophia you know when it is basically a question and answer se session with jesus most of the questions are asked okay in the pistis sophia most of the 40 uh, 39 out of 42 questions are asked by mary magdalene to right. jesus and they are very right. esoteric questions so unless you have some deep background in esoterica and very esoteric answers you don't know what the hell they are talking about if i didn't study you know esoteric tantra i wouldn't know which is you know actually the whole explains the, the, the different levels of human consciousness so to speak then you okay. wouldn't you, you don't know what they are talking about it to think it's like a science fiction flying into different spheres and so on you know oh, okay. and in the gospel of mary magdalene when uh, it's the disciples who ask mary tell us what teacher told you uh, so you know we can understand and peter who is always portrayed by gnostics as the one who who is you know really pissed off because he's how come he told her this stuff and we don't know anything about yeah, it yeah <laughs> you know? and that's really hilarious too because you have <laughs> you have peter like getting all like well it almost it's almost kind of sounds like uh you know it's not fair you love her more than us and you love her more <laughs> than the other women and why and you kiss her like it's almost kind of like well no. um, <laughs> <laughs> kind of funny um yeah. and, but then there's also this other this other concept of of uh, the apostle john um being mm. the disciple that jesus loved and i mm. i have to wonder if john is actually mary magdalene um but they you know somebody wanted to rewrite that story and and make him into a male and give him a new name and and that is there I any, think that's the case. Found any? Yeah. I think that, that that's the case because event, you know, it's he says, go and talk to his beloved, and then eventually they, they change beloved to John, you know. So beloved disciple mysteriously changes to John. And you know, I'm not saying it uh, uh lightly because I used to be a Catholic and very devout, you know, and 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 but you know, I just couldn't find any nourishment there, and you know, just yeah. too much dogma and so on. And I must say very, with great sadness that Catholic Church has no use for women. Oh, and yeah, you know, and sure. we lived in times, you know, when uh, when the gospels were chosen, you know, and selected. And we know that it happened. It's a, it's a, you know, scholarly truth. It's just we know this happened. It's historical truth. You know, if if there was something about women, and I think Jesus was really a radical teacher personally. You know, yeah. so it's, so so they had to change it because it couldn't be. You know, if you read church fathers, you know, a woman is abomination. Basically, how does she dare this? Yeah. Uh, obnoxious vipers you know because there were movements gnostic movements such as carpocratians and others who had women's leaders like marcelina historical figures you know who actually did accept sexuality interestingly you know so this is yeah. always how women kind of went you know it is okay right yeah, like yeah, conscious yeah. sexuality is okay yeah um they, they were called uh, this this obnoxious or arrogant vipers you know by church fathers so women were nothing so i believe that it was personal i believe it is changed and yeah. until this day even with most you know progressive popes they think nothing of women and you know what uh they are they they basically are um uh, preparing their own grave for themselves because people are leaving catholic church you know in, in you know in thousands 
you know, yeah. because they just refused to change. And I yeah. think they adjusted it right from the beginning. The beloved is Mary Magdalene. You know, the beloved is Mary Magdalene. And there are Gnostic documents also that to testify to this, but they just, they just, co co they just couldn't take it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, can, right I can see them. You know? I can see them in the Council of Nicaea going, okay, well, this Gospel of Mary Magdalene is, is way too crazy. We've got to throw yeah, that yeah. away. And let's throw away this other one, this other Gospel of who, who mm -hmm. knows what it was called, but this other yeah. Mary Gospel. And somebody probably was like, well, you know, there's some good stuff in that one. What if we just change Mary into John? We could probably keep that book. Yeah, yeah, oh, right. yeah I suppose so. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. Like, and just to let you know that even the Gospel of John was the last one to be accepted to the canonical Gospels because it was considered too radical. So, yeah. and the Council of Nicaea took a long time and, you know, half of the bishops left in fury because, you know, they disagreed with what was decided. And at the end, they said, okay, Gospel of John, eh, eh, it's a bit crazy, but we'll keep this one. So yeah. even this was too radical, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's really difficult because um, when you have invested all of your life into a power structure that is 100% built on um, lies and ridiculous ideas, uh, it is really a house of cards, and you have to mm -hmm. you have to take um, really drastic measures in order to protect yourself. And I think that's what these guys are doing. That's what they've they've been doing. That's what they still do. Uh, that's why you know the the popes and the bishops and the, most of the priests in the world still today are probably ninety nine percent white males or you know or whoever else whatever mm -hmm. other kind of male uh, mm -hmm. hierarchy that holds the power in that area. And because they don't allow women, you know, they, they don't allow women, that's why they, they are this. Having said so, I must say, because I always try to be truthful, you know, I got Catholic education and, you know, I, 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 I everybody I met was absolutely fantastic. You know, they, everybody opened up my mind, but yeah. the structure of the dogma itself is just doesn't right. provide spiritual nourishment. So I don't have mm. a kind of complaint about priests I made, met or, you know, who taught me, who are always professors and so on. That was a good experience, in fact, for me. But, you right. know, the teaching itself had no spiritual nourishment, you know? So, right, and, and, right. and then I historically started to make, uh, you stop making sense as well. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of uh, very earnest and well-meaning uh, men, and some mm -hmm. of them happen to be uh, men in white. And just mm -hmm. because I, I'm a white man, and I, that doesn't mean I'm absolutely mm -hmm. a jerk, uh, but mm. I can I can choose to be one, right? That's so that's right. the thing is we always have that choice. Um, yeah. So, um, what else would you like to tell us about the book? Okay, maybe I would like to say about you know what I consider my original uh, research for the book. You know, because my question about Mary Magdalene and I just we don't have time to discuss it. I also discuss her in connection with Hindu goddesses, you know, tantric goddesses and so on. Yeah. I wanted to make a broader picture, but I also ask myself a question, and it's my favorite part of the other goddesses. You know, what happened to Mary Magdalene after the event of crucifixion? Because yeah. you know there are all kinds of traditions, including a very strong French tradition. You know that she went. To to southern France but yeah. even if she did go to southern France it, it according even to that tradition she went there 15 years after the event now it would not make sense for her to stay in, in Palestine simply because you know everybody was persecuted right everybody right. spread out so I was wondering this question and I was first of all just from a personal point of view I thought if I were Mary Magdalene I would go to Alexandria because it was a center of learning spiritual center and, you know, most uh, open-minded place in the world, right? And it was a right, library right. of Alexandria and all of this. And then I came across the work of another scholar who was uh, saying, uh, and she was actually writing about Philo of Alexandria, first century Jewish uh, Hellenistic philosopher, who wrote his famous work, Vita Contemplativa, in which he says that there was a group of philosophers and spiritual seekers around Alexandria who were called Therapete, and that they had connection with the uh, Gnostic groups in the Holy Land, as well as the uh, Temple of Isis in Alexandria, and they were called healers. Mm. And then even more interestingly, they invited women who were spiritually or intellectually gifted. 
So wow. I felt like if I were Mary Magdalene, and especially that they had connection with Nassins, and lots of uh, scholars believe that Jesus may have the connections with, and so John the Baptist with the Essenes, I'm sorry, with the Essenes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would probably, you know, try Alexandria because there was, you know, I would actually be functional there, right? Because right. My, my spiritual training would be appreciated, you know, on both sides, Egyptian and there is some Egyptian sides to her story as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, and 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 what I, you know, with her time with Jesus as well. So I started to look into uh, even any anecdotal, any evidence, you know, whether there was a woman in Alexandria who was somehow prominent, you know, in, in spirituality. And in fact, there was a woman in the first century Alexandria called Mary the Jewess, Mary the Prophetess or Mary the Alchemist who had the oh. alchemical school and she specialized in spiritual alchemy, specializing in ascension. And her name is, and you know, and she, we know of her, first of all, it's true because I check in the National Library of Israel in open uh, sources, you know, that there was a woman like that. Yeah. Uh, in first century Alexandria, but we know of her also through another historical figure, another alchemist, Egyptian alchemist called Zosimus, who is a historical figure, this, this know for sure, and who says that one of his predecessors in spiritual alchemy was this woman, Mary the prophetess, Mary the Jewess, also or Mary the alchemist, and the reason why she was allowed to open school, a school and teach it to everyone and G uh, pure blood Egyptians were not allowed to do this because you know they were uh, forbidden by the state to share their knowledge with the foreigners oh yeah because she was not fully Egyptian she was either Jewish or part Jewish uh, so that uh, gave her that freedom and oh, okay. another point that I found that was very interesting that Zosimus was from Akmin and guess where the gospel of Mary Magdalene was found in Akmin as well so I oh, think wow. there was already a tradition there you yeah. know what I mean? This so is I, really, uh, this is really driving with, um, the, I don't know if you had a chance to, uh, to listen to uh, the episodes I did with uh, Ralph Ellis, but he's, yeah. he's really into this. Um, like, he's got this whole uh, historical bunch of historical people that, um, that he has done all this research on over like a 30 year period. And basically, he's saying, okay, the, here's here's a bunch of people that were from uh well the, they moved around a bit but basically he's he's identified these this group of people and said like okay well this guy is also who we became known as jesus but he's actually this guy and so his what you're saying there ties in very very strongly with with um some of the, the stuff that uh that ralph yes. has dug up and uh yeah, check him out. And he's got a bunch of books, like he's got, I think, 11 books, um, and they're all quite thick. So you you might have a lot of reading to do, but um, fascinating uh, topic. And also because the timeline, like you mentioned, with the 15 year bit of a 15 year gap, possibly, mm -hmm. um, Ralph figures that uh, the the timeline was actually pushed back um, by almost 30 years. So that might uh, reconcile Maybe. some of those issues as well. Well, and I just want to add, just I just wanted to add something about that. Oh, when you talk about Jesus, maybe it was this and that. Recently, my friend Miguel Conner was giving this great lecture about Simon Magus, uh, Magus oh, yeah. or Magus. And, you know, there is a pretty good evidence that, you know, uh, lots of people believe that Jesus and Simon Magus are one and the same person, the same like Helen of Tyre, who was the sexual and spiritual partner of Simon Magus is Mary Magdalene. So mm -hmm. uh, he joked, Kingly says, I really like his metaphor, so I'm repeating his metaphor, it's not my own, but yeah. Jesus and, and Mary Magdalene is a family edition, it's like the Beatles, and Simon Magus and Helen of Tyre are like the Rolling Stones, you know, it's, I oh, yeah. love it. because it is, <laughs> they're the same couple, it's just that one is just portrayed like very radical and it was way too radical because, you know, he was just doing the miracles all over the place and he was not hiding his in the sexual and spiritual relationship with this woman, Helen of Tyre, whom he considered embodiment of goddess Sophia and Mary Magdalene in Gnosticism is, you know, supposed to be embodiment of, Mary Ma of goddess Sophia. So there are all of this connection, but because it was just too wild, you know, so they had to have like a clean it up and it, it was Jesus and Mary Magdalene. So this is another possibility when we say who is who, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Well, there's absolutely no no doubt that uh, that there was a lot of revisions. Like what mm. the book that we read, uh, and you know, we think it's the word of God, so it has to be right and absolutely true. Um, but you know, men have been men specifically have been sticking their fingers in there uh, for at least for two thousand years, and and for a lot longer than that, if you depending on you know, how far back you trace a lot of these traditions. So there is no, uh, there is no way of just opening up a book and going here, this is the truth. We have it. We have the whole picture here. Um, there's a lot of puzzle pieces, I think. Can I elaborate a little bit on this? I think yeah, that you know, when a great beings come, such as Jesus, such as Mary Magdalene, whether they are, you know, goddesses or, you know, priests or, you know, priestesses or, you know, uh, enlightened beings however you want to call them uh they have a con they have opened up their being their minds to cosmic consciousness when we call it or you know to so they are in the flow with divine mind so to speak you know right. and and then they teach and then we absorb what we can understand on our level and unfortunately, right. some of the people were on Jesus and Gnostics would argue that it's Peter is one of them, unfortunately responsible for the, you know, building up the church structures, understood the least of it. Yeah. So it is almost like we have this transistor radios in our heads. And, you know, if you are not tuned in to the same level that, you know, he or she was, then you get it. And then you say, oh, this couldn't be true, shh, shh, you know, because yeah. it's just beyond what we can understand. Like some people nowadays cannot say, oh, UFOs don't exist because it's like, way too much for them. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. The dimensions don't exist because, ah, too scary, too scary. Yeah. So, yeah. so the same with this. So I think the message is true. It's just that people who wrote down the message, they sometimes unconsciously even edited it because they just couldn't comprehend the depth right. of the message. That yeah, transistor absolutely. radio was not tuned in. You know what I mean? That transistor yeah. radio was really small, and uh, you know, <laughs> the minds were small. Yeah. So that's why I do not believe in any form of fundamentalism for that, because people who write down something, they think they they do right thing, but what they understood. Also, I would like to believe that we as species evolve over the last two thousand years, including spiritually. Yeah. I'm not talking about biological evolution, which is boring, but spiritually, you know. So then, you know, now if we heard certain messages, like for example from Gnostics. you know, we would understand them much better because we are much more open-minded. I would hope. So, you know, at least yeah. some people. So, so I think this is part of it too, that people who write down these things just um, didn't understand certain things. So that's why even for, for intelligent people, even certain things in the Bible kind of don't make sense because, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't probably make sense to the people who wrote them down because they didn't, it was just, you know, they didn't grasp the whole breadth of, right. of the message. Right. Well, and, and maybe that is really the, the ultimate message of Mary and of Jesus and of all the Gnostics and, and probably all the Magi and, and mm. the various uh, all kinds of traditions is that a, a lot of these people are really kind of saying the same thing. And that is you do have to look within yourself mm. because you can't just look in a book. You can't mm. just listen to a guy. Uh, you can't just listen, watch a YouTube podcast or whatever. You, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we have to process in order to start to comprehend even the tiniest grain of what truth really is, uh, because truth is complicated. Hmm. Beautifully put, Ken. Yeah, so basically the book or the teacher or the YouTube podcast can point you in a direction. The rest mm -hmm. is up to you. Yeah. Right. Well, that's awesome. And I think that's a great way to end. So thank you so much for joining us today, Joanna. Um, it was a real pleasure to talk to you. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll get to talk again pleasure sometime. Definitely. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. Yeah, thanks for joining us again. And uh, please uh, make sure you check out Joanna's book, The Other Goddess, uh, Mary Magdalene and the Goddesses of Eros and the Secret Knowledge. And uh, I'll put a link underneath here so uh, you can just click on that. Um, and yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe. It does help us a lot. And uh, make sure you uh, check out some of our other videos and, and uh, do come back. We'll catch you next time.